tell us from Pew's perspective what this World Congress of the IUCN can achieve for oceans. IUCN comes together every four years, explores major issues, major conservation problems, and proposes solutions. But also governments and non-governmental organizations use this way as a way of getting together and passing motions or resolutions every four years as to what needs to happen, what needs to change. A few environment group and other groups have come to this IUCN World Conservation Congress to highlight marine conservation issues and try to bring problems and solutions to bear here and to have some motions adopted that help progress those issues, such as issues pertaining to marine reserves, high seas biodiversity, shark conservation, and tuna conservation. Although there was significant disappointment coming out of Rio, there was some progress on ocean issues. There was good progress on issues such as illegal fishing, and sustainable fishing. On high seas biodiversity, there was good discussion, strong support that the issue is a high priority, but because of opposition from some governments, all they could agree was this is a major issue and they're going to make a decision in two and a half years what to do about it. We've come with other groups to this IUCN Congress, where the focus here is on conservation, to get a strong recommendation from this Congress to take the decisions of Rio to the next level. We'd like IUCN to endorse making progress at the UN and to endorse negotiating a new agreement, preferably under the law of the sea, so that we can finally establish marine protected areas, including marine reserves, national parks, if you will, on the sea, in areas beyond national jurisdiction. Specifically on marine protected areas, give us a sense of you know what the situation in, is now and how they need to be better defined and effectively managed. The oceans are less than 1% protected. There are massive industries, fishing, mining, extracting oil and gas across the world's oceans. 70% of our planet is ocean, and what is desperately needed is protection of places, special places in the ocean that must have protection if we're going to have a sustainable future for the sea. And in particular, the most important type of these marine protected areas are what are called marine reserves. And within countries' waters, for example, what many countries are now stepping up and setting up their waters as a total marine reserve. And that's what's needed, is countries either in all their waters or part of their waters to establish these reserves. My final brief question would be on sharks, on progress up to now and what uh, you'd like to see come out of this Congress. The situation facing sharks globally is dire. Approximately 30% of all shark species are believed to be critically endangered, endangered or threatened with extinction. IUCN has a long history of looking at species conservation. What we want, the Pew Environment Group, would like IUCN to pass a strong motion and for its members to take strong action to stop this decline in shark species. We're calling for governments to list several shark species on the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species next March, and this IUCN Congress has a real chance to endorse that move. Amanda, first of all, IUCN is obviously an important enough Congress in its own right, and especially after Rio. What is Pew seeking specifically on tuna at this Congress? What Pew is looking for for tuna conservation at this um, IUCN World Conservation Congress here in Jeju, Korea, is um, some clear commitments from governments and others involved in the Congress towards improving tuna conservation and management, particularly towards actually taking steps to put catch limits in place for commercial fisheries and to address some of the management challenges and risks posed by the use of fish aggregating devices or FAT, which is currently occurring with very little management or control in place. With the question of catch limits, some people might be surprised that those aren't already in place, or is it a question of people not heeding scientific advice? 
With respect to catch limits, there are a number of different challenges. Firstly is that um, in some regional fisheries management organizations, which are the international bodies that govern fishing of straddling stock, which are um, fish that occur both between uh, national waters of a country and in the high seas, um, some RFMOs have in place what people consider might be catch limits, which might mean that they've limited the amount of catch to a certain year in the past. But what isn't in place across the board for tuna fisheries is a catch limit informed by science that says that this is the absolute amount that you can take out. And what we'd like to see particularly is the use of what are called reference points, which is a system, um, a part of a system of fisheries management that many, many countries signed up to as part of the UN Fish Stocks Agreement. And it puts in place the idea of a target limit, which says we want to keep fishing at about this amount each year based on scientific advice. But it also has a limit point, which says if for some reason we go past that target, there are immediately um, indications that we are heading towards a limit and that we need to take further action. So it, it's a much more comprehensive way of managing tuna fisheries. Secondly, where there aren't even those really, really basic limits that, that might be tied to a previous year's catch, as I previously mentioned, um, where there aren't those limits, um, in many cases, what is used is what we would call an input control, which means that the uh, that the RFMO might say, well, only a certain number of boats can go fishing for tuna, or fishing will only be allowed for a certain number of days per year. And while that sounds like a good solution, what it effectively does is incentivize the building of boats that can catch more on that particular day. And so it controls the amount of effort you put into the fishery, but it doesn't control the amount of fish that comes out. Our belief, um, and we believe that this is backed up by the best available science and by the commitments made in the UN Fish Stocks Agreement and other places, is that to really effectively manage tuna fisheries, which in the Pacific are worth $5.5 billion alone, you really need to have in place a comprehensive science-based system of catch limits. It was very exciting to us to actually find out that the World Conservation Congress was going to be held here in Korea because Korea has a critical role to play in tuna fishing. In 2010, the country ranked third in the world. So Korea came third in the world in terms of the most fresh tuna consumed, meaning that the only two countries that came ahead of that were Japan and the U.S. Um, Korea is also one of the top 10 um, countries catching tuna globally, and it comes in fourth with 6.7% of the global catch. In the Western and Central Pacific alone, which is where the world's largest tuna fishery is, um, Korea catches about 12% of the tuna caught. So that makes it a, a critical player. It also has a very particular role to play in the Pacific bluefin fishery, um, which is a, a much smaller fishery and is one of the larger tunas that's much sought after for sashimi. Uh, Korea plays a very big role in that fishery and, in fact, unfortunately, not always the most responsible role. And currently, a lot of its catch is juvenile of Pacific bluefin. So the fact that, there, that Korea has chosen to host this World Conservation Congress and put an incredible amount of work into providing a stage for the discussion of some of the world's most um, complex and important conservation problems means that it's an opportunity also for us to promote to Korea the need for them to really step up um, and basically walk what they talk and take the decisions that need to be taken to put the Pacific bluefin fishery on um, strong conservation and management grounds. Christina, first of all, explain what is happening um, for oceans at this IUCN Congress. It's trying to tackle oceans at a higher, more environmental scale than we were able to do at Rio because it brings states, conservation organizations together in a forum where conservation organizations have almost an equal voice to governments. The IUCN Congress can decide to go beyond what was agreed at Rio by trying to urge governments to take a decision at an earlier point in time. They can try to create more concrete language, like calling for an implementing agreement to the Law of the Sea Convention. They can just help to generate political will by bringing so many governments together, as well as the conservation community to say, this is something that we want, this is something we will work forward together in order to flesh out the details for some governments who still have questions. Specifically on the high seas, what can the IECN do that where Rio failed? 
Well, at IUCN, we have over a thousand members now, and we can raise our voices and call for strong protection for areas for the high seas, for areas beyond national jurisdiction. We can work together with our thousand members, uh, including conservation organizations and states from around the world, to unify our skills and talents in order to detail the many ways that we would like to see the high seas protected, conserved, and sustainably managed for the benefit of future generations as well as for us all. Here at the IUCN Conservation Congress, we've had numerous activities focusing on the high seas. We've had knowledge cafes, we've had workshops, we've had events in the Blue Pavilion that's located down here on the main floor. We've had Sylvia Earle talking about the oceans, the high seas in plenary and high-level sessions. We've had the World Heritage Convention talk about the need to expand the coverage of their convention out to the high seas. I won't say the government officials, but starting to explore these various aspects. People are saying, what can I do to help the high seas? It's a wonderful, exciting experience. After IUCN's Conservation Congress, I think we've created new enthusiasm, new momentum amongst a new group of people. Everybody, when they hear high seas, they just, it clicks. They know why it's important to maintain every second breath in the planet. So we're creating new allies and new opportunities to move ahead. In fact, I've just been talking with the organizers of IMPACT 4, which is going to be talking about marine protected areas, bringing people together from all around the world. We're going to have a session on high seas. So many opportunities creeping up.